My name is Alex Caserta. As an artist and photographer, my mission is to create documentaries using a straightforward approach. One of my goals is to continue telling stories that include historical information, inviting the viewer to develop a sense of place. Welcome to a new series of episodes that showcases farming, the individuals who work the land and sea, the stewardship of open spaces, and the importance of supporting the local farmers in the ocean scape. This, this is, is Harvesting Rhode Island. Rhode Island. I'm here at Wright's Dairy Farm today in North Smithfield, Rhode Island. I'm here with Ellen Puccetti, and she is one of the original family members, fourth generation? Fourth generation. Fourth generation. Thanks for having us. Yeah, oh, thank you for letting us come up here. This is uh, very nice. This is our first dairy farm that we're doing on the series. I'm very excited. You have uh, about 100 cows here? Yes, we're milking about 100, 120, depending on what uh -huh. time of the year, what season. Yeah, and what's special about, about the dairy farm here is the fact that you are processing your milk. Yes. On yes. location. Yep. That's what we feel makes us different and unique because we actually have the cows here, we're milking the cows, we have our own processing facility where we're processing the milk here, and then we also have the store where we're selling milk retail here on the farm. And is there a particular type of cow that actually uh, one would use for milking? Well, there are a couple different cows that are used for milking, but we have Holsteins. Holsteins. Yes. I used to hear about Jersey cows all the time, but... Yes. Jersey cows are a little smaller frame and they have a very high butter fat count. So oh, okay. um, if you wanted to make cheese or um, products with, that you require a lot of butter fat, you would want to use the Jersey milk. Your cow, are they um, on a specific type of diet besides the hay and the corn? Or yes, it's a total mixed ration. They call it a TMR. And it has um, a certain balance of corn, hay, grains, and minerals. And that recipe is done on a weekly basis. Okay. And depending on the forage that we chop, the corn and the hay, it varies. So we have that tested every season so that we know what to supplement with to make it the balance that we're looking for. And in the balance that you're looking for is, uh, I'm assuming, to make the cow uh, more nutritional? Well, it's obviously for nutrition for the cow, yeah. but it's to help the cow produce the maximum amount of milk possible. Okay. And a good tasting milk. So whatever you feed the cow will result in a flavor in the milk. So you want to make sure that whatever you're feeding the cow is um, a good sweet mix so that you get that flavor in the milk. Oh, that's very interesting. That's something that I, I think most people would, would not think about. And that's what makes us unique as well because we're able to control what the cows are eating and create that nice flavor that our customers like. Now uh, this farm began uh, about a hundred years ago? Yes, yes. We celebrated our hundredth anniversary in 2014. 2014. So yeah, it was a big milestone for us. And you had a great, great grandfather who was French Canadian. Yes, who yes. Who came over. And my great grandfather um, bought this specific piece of land and started the farm here. So he built the dairy barn and started with some Holsteins. Then he built the, the farm's home farm where he brought his family down and settled on this specific piece of land. And um, it was always something where they were selling uh, milk, dairy products to the community. So started that right brand a long time ago, which is really important to us. Uh, when do you think they actually purchased the pasteurizing equipment? So when pasteurization became the standard in the 30s, 40s, in that time frame, um, they decided to invest the money and purchase the equipment and start pasteurizing and homogenizing the milk here on site, which, is, which was a big turning point for, I think, the farm looking back. Because if that wouldn't have been, if that didn't take place at that time, then the farm probably would not have survived this many years. So it allows us the control and flexibility to process our own milk here on site and not rely on another dairy for that production. I know when I was a kid growing up in Rhode Island, there were dairy farms all over the place. I, I could think of maybe two or three just around my neighborhood uh, where I grew up. 
and uh, over the years they've been disappearing. Uh, is there a particular reason why you think that's actually happening or happened? Well, I think like I just talked about with the whole pasteurization aspect of things, I think a lot of small farms, which were homestead farms way back then, um, decided they didn't want to invest that kind of money and um, it, it fell by the wayside. Um, another part of that is that the next generation coming in decided they wanted to work off the farm. They wanted to work at a nine to five, five job. They didn't want to work, you know, seven days a week caring for animals. So I think that that generation decided to move on and sadly the farm had no alternative but to um, basically close you know, close down close down absolutely well thanks so much for all this information Ellen it's all very important I think thank you very much again for chatting with us today it's my pleasure I'm here with Clayton Wright. I guess this is what, the larger barn that you have? Yeah, this is our milking cow freestall barn that was built in about 2002. 2002. Completed, yes. Okay, how many cows can you fit in here? We can fit 120 cows in here comfortably. Uh, our numbers are a little bit lower than that. We're right around 100 right now, just because of the variation in when the cows get pregnant and when the cows calve in and come oh, back okay. to the herd. And uh, how many times a day do the cows get milked? We milk the cows here twice a day. We milk them once at 3.30 in the morning and once at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 3.30 in the morning, wow. Yeah. We try to keep it 12 hours periods. Yep. And uh, you hook them up to machines? Yep, um, the milking process will start. We have the parlor we'll set up and we have 10 machines on one side and 10 machines on the other side of the parlor. And the cows come into the parlor 10 cows on each side, yep. and when the cows come in, the operator will dip them with an iodine-based antibacterial to get any surface bacteria, kill anything that's on the teat end. They will strip them a little bit to get the milk flowing, and then they'll take a clean microfiber towel and wipe that cow. Each quarter, flip the towel and wipe it again so it's very clean and very dry. Dry is very important. And then they'll take the machine and they'll attach the four units, four quarters, to the cow. And then that machine will milk the cow out in usually five to eight minutes per cow. And that machine knows when the cow is finished milking. When her milk flow has dropped below a set amount, yep. pounds per minute, right. that machine will automatically detach from the cow. And then that cow is finished milking. That's incredible. Do you ever sell any of your cows? Um, we don't sell any of our cows to go to another milking herd. Yeah. Um, we take care of our cows very well and we keep them for as long as we can, as long as they're milking. Right. The cow's not giving enough milk to pay her way, feed costs, labor costs. She gets retired. Retired. It's interesting. I'm not going to ask you where they retire to. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's an yeah. animal and it's, it's, it's yeah. a source of beef. You'd much rather have them be used for beef in a product versus just going in the ground. Or oh, just, absolutely. You know, you know, so. <laughs> All right. If somebody was, was, was actually had the money to start out, what does it cost to purchase a cow? Um, a cow can range from $1,200 up to $2,500. Wow. Um, there's, there's purebred cows that can go for twenty, thirty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000. So really? That's a whole nother, another industry almost. Wow. Well, Clayton, thanks, thanks very much for explaining everything that you do here. No I appreciate the information. You're welcome.
in Wright's Dairy, which is quite large and extensive, and I'm, I'm talking with Paul, who manages the bakery. I can't believe the products that you carry here, and a, a lot of the products that you make uh, come from the milk that you process on site? Sure, um, a lot of the milk that we use, uh, that was part of the, the problem with milk back in the day in the 70s, they needed to use up the excess milk that the farm was producing. So they started the bakery to use up some of that excess milk. So we use a lot of that milk for our custards and our chocolate puddings. Everything's made from scratch. Um, we use it in a lot of our scratch formulas. Mm -hmm. So on average, we're using 150, 200 gallons of milk on a regular week. Wow. Um, and that's on a weekly basis. So that and the heavy cream, you know, we skim the heavy cream off. That allows us to use heavy cream for all the pastries that we make. So, um, so it's really beneficial that we have the cows right here and we can process it here and use it in our own operation. Let's talk about the ingredients that you use when you're baking. If we had to make a comparison, because you're getting uh, the milk and because it's so fresh, how does that affect the quality of the product that you're producing? I mean, the quality of the product is so much better because the flavor is much better. Um, we're able to control the amount of uh, pro the protein in our milk, so the coloring is different when we bake things based on the protein and the in the milk. Um, and then the fat content can be much higher. We a uh, full you know whole milk we're using in the bakery, which is a full four percent typically. Um, lots of times you're using milk that's two and a half, three and a half percent. So that extra half a percent or more of heavy cream in the milk makes a big difference in the flavor and how things bake up. Do you do any products that uh, uh, have some sort of traditional flavor to them? Well, we do some French products. So um, coronets or cream horns are a, okay. a puff pastry dough. So we laminate all our own puff pastry dough here. Um, so it's a long process. You know, we spread butter on it and roll it out. It gets rolled out eight times to give us as many as 80 layers in between wow. the dough so that when it puffs up, it's really nice. So we just started making all that, laminating that ourselves. Um, so that's a really nice quality product with dairy products, you know. Yeah, we well, use milk in that dough as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Paul, for letting us come in here and talk about the bakery and the products well, you're that welcome. you carry. Thank you very much for coming. You know, a big part of what we do here is to be able to have the cows here, process the milk and sell it in the store. It, it really adds to the customer's experience. They get to see the whole process and know where their food comes from. And I like to call it the milk less traveled, so. Yeah, and it also uh, is a great uh, sustainable uh, situation to support the cows when you're not selling as exactly. much milk. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. We help each other out. We lean on each other to keep going. So. Terrific. Yeah, great. Well, Thanks. thank you very much. Okay. All right. I'm at uh, Emma Acres in Exeter, Rhode Island today, and I'm here with Scooter and Alex, who's one of his daughters, and uh, we are at a dairy farm where we have about 70 cows. Now, you don't all, uh, milk all 70 cows, right? No, right now we're milking uh, about 38 cows, and the rest are either dry cows, calves, or heifers. Okay, what time do you milk? Usually 5.30 in the morning, 5 o'clock at night. 5.30 and 5. Okay. Seven days a week. Seven days a week. So you can't go anywhere. Oh, no. You, you, you get people to help so you yeah. can take time off. And, uh, but no, Christmas morning, New Year's Eve, yep. it's all the same. So you do not pasteurize here? We do not. Okay. So there is a system set up for um, dairy farms that is extremely complicated. And even after I've had several conversations with uh, dairy owners, uh, I still have uh, a difficult time trying to figure it all out. Uh, you sell your milk to our, Agrimark. Our to milk Agrimark. is sold to Agrimark as okay. a base co-op that we belong to. They, okay. they handle all so of our milk. Agrimark gets the milk. Yes. And then it goes to uh, a dairy um, a dairy producer a dairy where they producer. pasteurize it, homogenize it, and package it. That's when Rody Fresh buys the packaged product. They'll sell it for you. Yes. So once it leaves you, you really don't have any contact with it again. No, no. Okay, it gets handled by a number of other, uh, if you want to call them distributors. Well, there's a hauling outfit that comes every two days, um, you know, every other day, 
and they back up and they, they take our milk, they, they pump it out, they weigh it, they sample it, and then they go on to the next farm. And um, from there, they take it to a dairy um, where it's processed. Okay. So Agri Agrimont is a, a fairly large uh, industry. New England and New York, dairy farmer owned. Well, dairy farmer owned. And they get milk from a bunch of farmers from New England. Correct. And New York. In New York. And then they turn around and some of their milk that they purchase goes to making cheese like Cabot. Yes. Some of it goes to butter. And we actually just started a new yogurt and uh, whey because everybody's into the whey protein now. So Cabot Agrimark handles whey protein with some of the milk. And what will they do with the whey? What form does that come out in? Uh, like everybody buys to and put in their smoothies. Protein. Powdered protein. Yes. Okay. Now, is the government purchasing any of this? They purchase, yes, they purchase the overage from all the dairies in the United States. Okay. And, you know, they make their government cheese and their butter and their dried powder that, you know, we used to ship all over the country. The end result is that they try not to waste any of the milk that's being produced by the cows if they can help it. Right, but in the past few years, there's been co-ops that have had to dump tanker load after tanker load of milk because there is no place to put it. They can't make any more powder. They can't make any more cheese. There's just no place to move it. So it, there's too much milk sometimes yep. to actually produce a product, and right. that milk gets wasted. Correct. So that's a money loss for the farmer? And the co-op. And the co-op. Um, and actually some of the farms out towards New York and stuff, they actually stopped, co-ops have stopped taking their milk because they just have no market for it. Okay. So is there a better way of producing milk for the community other than the system that's currently in place. Agrimark has talked about supply management and they don't want to do that because that means that like they're trying to manage your business and tell you what you need to do. Um, the best thing, I mean, dairy in a whole has gone down uh, for consumption over the last few years just because people didn't think it was good for them. But now with some things that have come to light, I mean, they found out that drinking whole milk is actually better for you. So that's good because Drinking whole milk takes more milk off the market. Eating full fat cheeses. The yogurt industry has gotten really big. Uh, Cabot actually makes a lot of yogurt products now that they didn't use to. So, you know, the, the co-ops are trying to do everything they can to move more milk in different different ways. Different directions in right. terms of products. And even Rody Fresh, we've stepped into the butter and we produce two specific types of cheese. We have a uh, butter case cheese, which is made from a farm down the road, Cottrell's. It's only Ashier milk that goes into that butter case cheese. And then our cheese, uh, which is on under the Americas label for Rody Fresh, is a Foster Gloucester, which is a double Gloucester cheese. Um, and that, they come and pick up my milk individually. They take it to the cheese manufacturer. They make it, so it's our milk, our cheese, Rody Fresh markets it and sells it. I mean, yeah, the more the more avenues we can get. I mean, if there was seven local cheese makers around here, boy, that'd be handy because be we could get rid of more milk. Now, uh, the government regulates the price of milk. Correct. Because I think everyone in the past has heard about this through newspaper articles. Right. It's probably been quiet for the past so many years, but I can remember when I was growing up that it was always in the paper about how the dairy farmers were closing down because uh, the government was uh, controlling the price of the milk. Now, I'm assuming they're still doing that. Yes, because they buy the excess, so they control the price. At any typical time, you're losing about $3 a hundred weight to produce your milk and what it costs you to produce your milk. Um, so right now, if you're getting $17 a hundred weight, it actually costs you $21 a hundred weight to produce that milk. So farmers are actually losing money in the dairy business. Every, yes. In 2013, we had record numbers. I mean, the price of milk was out of control great. Um, so therefore you buy a new tractor, you put a roof on your barn. So you're spending the money as it's coming in to upgrade what you've had to let go 
while the price has been so bad because you know dairy farmers when when the price gets bad they go into hold mode they just slow down okay we're not doing this we're not doing that we're not putting tires on the skid steer we're going to run everything as long as we possibly can because we've got to feed these cows right. and make milk and some of the bigger farmers they look at it the other way and they will go ahead and put on a hundred more cows well that's yeah that's hurting the, the supply and demand be, but that's their idea we need another 10,000 a month in income, so the only way we can do that is by putting on another 100 cows. Most dairy farmers have to have other means of making money in order to support the dairy business. It helps, yes. I mean, it helps. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to make money out of a business where you're losing money. No, no. So, no, I mean, I have another business that we run, and my wife works full time. Um, and that's how we kind of keep managing the, the losses here. Now, Alex, you recently graduated from the University of Rhode Island, and you um, began working for Rhodey Fresh. Correct. So what can you tell me about Rhodey Fresh as a business? Is it something that's good for the state oh, of Rhode absolutely, Island? absolutely, yeah. It is. Um, any profit that Rhodey Fresh makes gets distributed back to our five farms. Um, so any purchase of Rhodey Fresh milk goes back into the farmer's pocket. Uh, most all of our farmers are a part of the Agrimark co-op, so that co-op is cheese and butter, as we mentioned before. Rhodey Fresh is giving an avenue for fluid milk to our farmers. You make more money on the, the cheese and the butter, but because Agrimark doesn't advertise fluid milk, Rhodey Fresh stepped in to try and help subsidize those farms. The milk leaves, the dairy farmer gets processed, and goes to Rhodey Fresh for distribution? Yes, yep. And Rhodey Fresh is, it takes care of the total distribution. So um, we find the markets or the stores or the universities to sell to, and we have our three delivery trucks that we deliver um, all the products to. We are constantly finding new customers. Um, schools and universities are a big customer for us, and we actually okay. just picked up Johnson & Wales University. They're buying That's great. Sh strictly Rhodey Fresh products for not only their culinary classes, but also um, their cafeterias and their, um, their dorm room. And a lot of the higher end restaurants are using our product Yeah, also. like a Machunic oh. Oyster Bar. Uh, they use our heavy cream and our half and half, Boathouse Restaurant, uh, uh -huh. Castle Hill. But yeah, a lot of restaurants like to support the local um, the local milk because it's one of those industries that can be local all year round. We have yes. local fresh milk all year round. That's right. Sometimes it's hard to find local greens all year round. You can't uh -huh. do it um, like local fruits and vegetables. Um, mm -hmm. So milk is one of those things that they can say, yes, we're serving local milk all year round. And the colleges handle a lot of our milk. And uh, we, yes. we take cows to campus, and that's the funniest yeah. thing. You go into Brown or Providence College, and you got a, a cow there, and <laughs> it's like kids come over, well, this is where your milk comes from. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> like we bring the brown cow to Brown University, and we'll yeah. go to Roger Williams is another one of our large That's very customers. cool. Yeah. yeah. And it connects the... The students that are drinking the milk to actually where their milk comes from. Oh, I love it. I love it. And you have school groups who come out here. Yep, yep. We've had many school groups, um, you know, all sorts. My wife's church groups and friends come out, um, friends from work, you know, because a lot of people just don't really understand where this stuff comes from. They think they go to Stop and Shop, pull it off the shelf, and that's where <laughs> it is. Um, Another thing. Cabot and Agrimark does is every other year they host an open farm day here where they put a lot of advertising in and anyone from the community can come here and um, look around and learn exactly where the products come from. Would you encourage younger people to go into the dairy business at this point? Well right now it's, it, we're at a tough crossroads because the co-op Cabot Agrimark is not accepting any new members so like if Alex wanted to start shipping milk I would theoretically have to bring her in under my contract to give it to her so that she could start shipping milk. If you wanted to say, okay, tomorrow I just won the lottery and I'm going to go buy a dairy farm and I'm going to ship my milk to Agrimark, they're, they're going to say, no, we're not accepting any, because that's kind of how they're trying to keep the fluid market in check, is by not taking on many, you know, any new... Uh, and they're trying to keep it in check because they don't want to have too much fluid coming right, in? Right. 
But, I mean, if you were a young man and you wanted to start out in the dairy business, sure, you could buy some cows, you could put in your own processing plant, and you could make your own milk. But the difficulty, that's a lot of money. So, yeah, the money when it comes to processing. Correct. Is there an alternative for someone who wants to work with the milking industry that you can think of or suggestions that you can give to someone who's young who would like to get into farming and uh, work on this end of the farming business? Well, yeah, I mean, you can go to college, you can become like a vet tech, you can become a vet, you are a large animal vet. You can actually go to college and learn about feed and feeding um, to become a herd manager. Um, you can go to school and become a, an AI tech, which is an artificial semination technician, um, which is how most of the dairy cattle are bred in the country now anyways. Okay, is there any message as a dairy farmer that you would like the community to know about, that you'd like to share with them? Any wisdom or places where we should be going that we're not necessarily going? Um, all milk is good, all dairy products are good. Eat a lot of cheese, drink a lot of milk, eat yogurt, um, and even for those people that are lactose intolerant, cheddar cheese has no lactose because it's taken out during the, uh, the process of making the cheddar cheese. A lot of people don't know that. Try it sometime if you are. Okay, that sounds terrific. Thanks so much mm -hmm. for having us up here today. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Thank you, Alex.